name's Les Arche. I'm going to present some talks to you today. And before I start, I'll just let you know that the fire exit, if the uh, alarms go off, the continuous alarm is just there. And it's just out the other side of this here. It's very easy uh, for us to think that accidents won't happen to us. We have our procedures in place, they're all good, we have uh, equipment, we have people, and they're all first class. So it won't happen to us. Will it? Today I want to share with you two events that have happened to me. Uh, this is uh, uh, I have numerous experiences, uh, so uh, that's why the, uh, the lucky is there, I'm told. So, I'm going to go through a little bit of an introduction. Uh, thoughts, 2002, first event, and 2006. Some of you may have, uh, have seen a video of 2006. I'm going to try and go through these first slides as quickly as possible, so I'm hoping you're going to read what's on the slide. Uh, whilst I chatter over the way in the, in the background. Um, as you can see, I started off as an electrician. Uh, so uh, you can see that by the timeline there, in the 70s, uh, that the grey hair is real. Not died. Um, and I went offshore, first of all, for two to three months, uh, just to get some extra cash. And the next statement you can see is at, uh, some years later, I was still there, I joined Amoco as an electric technician. I was promoted to an OIM, and the reason it's uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in highlighted there like that is the year was 1988. I joined Ruff uh, in 1999, uh, and uh, I'm currently uh, the responsible. A little bit about Ruff. Uh, I've got to be careful because I've got one of the, uh, one of the team here today. Um, as you can see, Ruff is a, uh, a, a offshore gas reservoir in which we inject gas and extract it. We uh, sell the storage to the industry, and so we store gas when the price is cheap. We produce gas when the price is expensive, and, and we make a little bit of money in, in the storage part of it and the transportation part of it. Um, Ruff has two platforms, three Bravo and H Alpha, and between them we have 30 wells. Uh, although only 24 of those wells are used for this. It's been around for quite a while, and whilst I chatter on, I'd like you to read this one just to see, uh, to reflect and consider your own uh, situation and your own companies. Um, Ruff has had a number of owners, uh, been owned by uh, a consortium in the early days and operated by Amoco. Um, in the, uh, uh, eventually it was sold to one of the partners, that was British Gas, a nationalised uh, industry at that time, and uh, they used it for, they started to build uh, uh, the storage site and put three Bravo in. Talking of three Bravo, this is the three Bravo platform. As you can see, BD um, has a helideck, Accommodation, temporary refuge, four lifeboats, four wells. Uh, the business end of Free Bravo is the central platform. All gas uh, processes are on there, gas compression, main power generation. Now there is also a secondary ICR there, one lifeboat. And over on the CD, uh, 12 wells, that's where our secondary cluster point is, and it has two uh, lifeboats. So, it's uh, 2002, uh, May the 8th, and we've just started our annual shutdown. POV is 128. Ian, uh, who is my ops engineer on the day, and I am in a conference hall uh, in the uh, conference room just outside the OEM's office. Um, it's uh, not a very nice day, there's some fog, mist about, 
problems are running. And the uh, standby boat is just uh, a little bit to uh, the north of the platform and is monitoring some fishing vessels that are, are always present uh, between us and the beach. And she notices that there's another fishing vessel coming out to join us. Uh, the skipper of the uh, standby boat looks at the vessel, believes it to be another fishing vessel, and, uh, and chooses really just to ignore it at that stage and just monitor it. Unfortunately, um, the vessel that had just come out of the Humber uh, was a fishing vessel, it was a fishing vessel, but it was a stern trawler uh, called the Marbella. Uh, and it had just come out, uh, uh, and the skipper of that had, uh, had a fairly hectic night, so as it cleared the Humber, he decided to go to his cabin. The first officer, first mate, uh, had some work to do down on the decks, so the second mate was left in charge of the bridge, and they provided uh, a watchman for a lookout. Unfortunately, uh, the second mate did not really understand radar, and so when he saw platforms standing uh, on the radar, he didn't actually recognise them as platforms. So, go back to our, our meeting, we're on a conference call, the time is 9.36 in the morning, and all of a sudden there's a tremendous bang, and the platform starts rocking so badly that it's difficult to stand still. Ian runs out of the uh, exit door uh, of the uh, conference room that we're in and that opens direct onto the south side of the little bit of the platform and onto a walkway. And as he looks down, he sees a fishing vessel coming beneath his feet, coming from under the platform and out. That's the uh, southwest leg of uh, BD. Uh, and at these pieces here, there were two uh, uh, bumper bars there uh, from the uh, installation. They weighed about four tonne apiece, and as you can see, they're both missing. Uh, this piece here down here is the escape to sea. Uh, this here uh, is the uh, uh, landing platform that can come down from this ladder onto here to get to this ladder here. Um, and they were all perfectly intact before the Marbella decided that uh, they had one packages. As I said, the um, platform was rocking quite badly. And unfortunately, the control room did hear the bang, but they didn't feel the rocking anywhere near as bad as we are. There are several doors below us. Um, but they did decide to sound the alarm because they thought it was actually one of the other Japanese. And if any of you have got general alarm systems, you'll know that the, uh, the operator switches on the general alarm and makes an announcement. And the announcement goes something like, uh, the sound you hear is the general alarm, please stop all work, make your work site safe, and report to your muster stations. The muster stations uh, on Bravo are of course on the TR. It was really the last place we wanted all the people. However, we did manage to get everybody across over to the BP platform. We must have been. And we went down into what we call BP 14, which is the production office over on the BP uh, platform. And then I found, well, I had a telephone, but I've got no radios. So I've gone steps, quickly you know, rode, rode around, find two radios, a marine band and, a, and an aviation band, hook up some uh, temporary aerial for me and start to, so I can start now to uh, manage an emergency. The Coast Guard had been informed both by us initially and also by the uh, um, by two other methods. The standby boat, boat had uh, called in and the Marbella had issued a pan pan. <coughs> So the uh, Coast Guard brings me up and says, uh, we've got two SARs scrambled towards you. Uh, what's your current situation? My well, current situation was we had 128 people mustered, no injuries. 
uh, but I needed to get rid of some of them because we, uh, in talking to the onshore support, uh, we had determined that we needed to do a structural survey of the BD platform before we could uh, reman re it. The problem is, uh, our safety case says a vessel of 6,000 tonnes travelling at four knots has the ability to cause structural damage. What does a vessel of 6,000 tonnes look like? I've got no idea. I saw this one, um, and it looked pretty big to me, uh, and it, uh, it's got a lot of damage, as you can see. And this is only the front part of it, uh, the first part that hit. Uh, the bridge uh, and uh, aerials also sustained damage uh, as she went through. However, we do know that this vessel wasn't travelling at four knots, it was travelling at 13 knots. Uh, so we had to assume the worst. Um, after I'd spoken to the Coast Guard, the Coast Guard then rang back and said, we've got some good news for you. There's a vessel going into the uh, uh, into Humber who has a heli deck and they're going to come in uh, close to you to, uh, to down, help down Manny. They can take some of your people off. A little bit later, a telephone or radio call with the uh, uh, Europa, uh, Navron Europa, uh, skippers on their line saying, how many people you've got to come off? And I said, well, I need over a hundred taken off. Oh yeah, we can manage that, no problem. So I start to think about uh, the size of this vessel. It can take a hundred people, just like that. Okay. Uh, he said, well, I'm just outside, uh, you're 500 metres on. Um, so any time you're ready, uh, we can start, to, as soon as the helicopters arrive, we can start to transfer people. I said, just out of interest, uh, Captain, what are you carrying? Uh, he said, uh, just some uh, squad petroleum uh, uh, things and, and some aviation fuel. But don't worry, um, we've got full DP capability here, so we're not going to move anywhere. And I said, well, just make sure you keep it that way, of course. <laughs> Two SARs arrive in field, and some of the crew have now cleared uh, some space on the CD platform. CD is a, a, a straight uh, top deck, and of course I can't use the heli deck because that's over on PD. So over the next uh, couple of hours, 85 people were transferred by winch off the CD platform to the helicopter and over to the naval uh, Europa. In the last 24 she take, they take, they take straight into Humberside. That left 19 of us on board. And then we had to talk to our colleagues over on 8 Alpha because we had no way of, uh, no sleeping arrangements, we had uh, no blankets. And most of all, uh, you can see we had no food because the uh, uh, galley never was over. And as you can see from me, uh, I like my food. Um, and luckily, the, uh, the crew over there did a magnificent job uh, and supplied us for the next three days. The Navarone uh, left us uh, at 13.30 on the day and made our way back into Grimsby. At 14.40, uh, 1400, sorry, the, the guys called me into the switch room where they had rigged up the television and they said, just look at this, the news is on. And there's a picture of two of our guys going up from the winch into the helicopter. We later found out that the daughter of one of those guys going up was on holiday in Spain and she'd just gone back into the hotel, looked into the reception and saw her father being airlifted into a helicopter. She rang home and said to her mum, what's going on? Is dad all right? And mum said, what do you mean? Well, I've just seen him being lifted into a helicopter. We hadn't had time to get round to all of the communications that we normally follow for uh, this type of evacuation, because we were obviously going through the POVs. 128, quite a few to go through. Um, so just something to bear in mind. The Europa entered, uh, uh, entered the, uh, the river at, uh, at uh, uh, Grimsby. Has to uh, put the anchor into the river because he's too big for the, uh, the port. 
and the 61 people that are left on there, we've taken some off by commercial helicopters on the journey in, are transferred to the Grimsby Dock by lifeboat. The management team are at uh, Grimsby Docks, and, and one of that <coughs> management team is here today, uh, just outside there. Um, Mark McGowan, the safety manager, was on the dock to meet them, and he describes uh, the, uh, the effect. Because on the way in, the skipper was a really kind, kind guy. He's, these guys have come off of a, a platform that's just been fired. They must be traumatised. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll open the bar for them. <laughs> so when the lifeboat came into Grimsby Docks, there's a lot of people hanging on the outside of it singing. <laughs> they either had a really good uh, journey or they, they, they enjoyed the drink. So, the investigation. Um, last week, the uh, Marbella uh, uh, didn't put a, a, a voyage plan in, which is required by the MCA. It was a failure to follow procedures by both the masters of the vessels uh, and a comment in the Marine Coast Guard investigation indicated that uh, each master routinely ignored that company. Uh, and in the case of the standby vessel, the standby vessel failed to alert the platform that there was anything wrong until after the incident. Some of the things that we've done since then, as you can see, the first three are from the, uh, uh, the MCA prosecution. But the important things from, uh, from the offshore piece was we fitted a radar system to three Bravo to extend uh, the uh, extent of our radar system. That uh, uh, now covers uh, a, a far greater distance than the ship can manage and is repeated to the, uh, uh, the, the supply of our supply and uh, your world veterans. And we also installed secondary hospital, secondary ICR. Whilst we're doing this one, I'm going to see if I can get this uh, thing to uh, fire up. I've been successful a couple of times today. Uh, 2006, February the 16th. Again, I'm, uh, I'm in the uh, conference room outside my office. I'm talking to uh, Howard, our office advisor, and Sean, who's our maintenance uh, manager. And there's a very deep rumbling noise, followed by a fairly loud bang. Sean goes to that same door that Ian went to, opened the door and looks out, and that's what we saw, that uh, flame is what we saw. Howard immediately ran down the stairs to the uh, control room to help out in the control room. That left uh, Sean and myself in the, in the meeting room, which also doubles as our main ICR. And we're wondering, what's happened? What's going on? On the day, you can see there are 58 people uh, on uh, the Three Bravo. Twelve of those people are over on the BP platform, and two of them are on CD. The rest are in the BD, in the accommodation, and, or, or in the BD workshops. And the reason for that is we routinely keep uh, monitoring personnel off the platform whilst we're bringing it online. And that morning, we were bringing it online. Uh, we've got trains one and two on, uh, and we were bringing on train three. Phil and Wayne were the two technicians that on the day that were bringing it on, and they were on the top deck of BP, and Wayne was just about to go down the stairs when the first bang hit us, and they got the first shove of the platform. And Phil said, just wait a minute. Uh, I don't know what that was. It could have been the fire pump starting up. But if it wasn't, what the hell was it? And no sooner as he said those words, than the pool of flame came up the stairs where the rain was just about to go down and over the top of the head. Sorry, got the name wrong, Warren. Warren then ran through the, uh, the process trains uh, towards the uh, 
Sidney Blackman. And as he was running, and he tells it much better than I do, he just noticed something. Before he had time to think, another ball of flame came up over the front of him, in front of him, and over his head. When we went to muster, um, we had uh, nine people made it over to the CD platform, the secondary muster point. The rest made it over to uh, BD, including two injured personnel. One had been uh, got some severe burns on his hands and face, and the other one was in shock. We got them up to the uh, medic, and they were being taken care of. We didn't uh, know the status of the BP platform, so I couldn't uh, bring the guys over uh, BP because I didn't know what they were going to go through. And you could still see the smoke and steam raising. So we decided that we would abandon by tent from CD. Unfortunately, although I know the message was sent, it wasn't received properly. Chris, who was at CD platform, and just happened to be a coxswain. Didn't hear the message. What he did hear was me talking to the uh, captain of the trader, telling him that we were going to uh, launch a life raft, a, 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 a lifeboat, and could he launch his fast rescue launch to come along and meet him. And that gave him the signal uh, to, to think about launching. So he got the people into the lifeboat, all kitted up, suited up, shut the doors, Went over to the start button, hit the start button, nothing. Again, Chris can tell this story much better than I do, and it's on the video. The language in the uh, lifeboat, I understand, was quite colourful at that stage. But Chris did come out, and he rang me and the ICR, and said, uh, can you get someone to talk through the start button? Called a mechanic in from the uh, master point. First question the mechanic says, Have you opened the valve? Brief silence, and Chris says, What valve? The recent refresher course that Chris had been on uh, used electric start lifeboats. Ours are hydraulic. And one of the things that we normally do with our hydraulic system is we pump it up, shut the outlet valve, which is under the seat of the coxswains, to ensure that whenever we go to, uh, to launch a life raft, we can open the valve and we'll have full pressure. This has forgotten that one point. It indicates that training's just not enough. You've got to do some familiarization training when that individual comes back. Training helps competence, but it doesn't prove competence. One other thing happens, um, we've got some very proactive uh, uh, logos on our, on our team and they quickly realised that there was a commercial flight in the field. They knew that we needed to get uh, some of our non-essential personnel down so they decided to take the 10 people and put them on the helicopter and send them in. SAR came in uh, and took the two uh, walking wounded into Grimsby. So that's nine, two, and 10. So we decided we would do through the reconciliation of the um, POV. At this stage, we didn't actually realize that the 10 had gone off on the flight. So when we did the numbers, we were short. As part of our routines, we uh, routinely make sure that all phone calls coming through to the uh, incident are only internal. I've got an outside line, I can take the calls from the life, uh, from any call coming up, but it comes direct to me. So Howard sits down to start his reconciliation, his phone rings. He picks it up and it's his son at the other end. His son is a, an apprentice working at our recent hotel. All his son says is, uh, no son is going on, Dad. He just wants to tell you, I love you. Reconciliation 
takes a little bit longer under those circumstances. But we got there, we got the numbers. And we managed. Uh, we realized that we needed to down land. So we've started the process, but we also wanted to uh, try and keep the platform land. So that's telling me I'm running out of time, incidentally, uh, behind me. So I'm going to hurry up. Uh, so what we did, uh, we started to uh, look across the, uh, the BP, realized that the uh, the cause of the accident was a, a, a cooler on uh, the gas cooler. I'll find the uh, presentation stick in a minute. Um, and that had failed. We also identified that the source of the ignition was the turbines for the main generation. So we had that, and we had that information. And just after five o'clock, uh, the emergency power failed and we later found out the cable in between the, the emergency generators was faulty, caused by the incident. So just after half past five, we down there as we rather flat. Uh, as I said, uh, there are lots of learnings. Um, I hope you never have to face anything like this. Um, it is frightening. It is worrying. And from an OAM's point of view, you wonder if you've missed something. I'm afraid that's all the time I have, uh, because you will now need to go to a, another booth. I hope uh, you haven't uh, had wasted your time here, and you enjoyed what I've done, and learned something from what we've done. If you have any questions, please, I'm around all day, um, please come up and ask me. Uh, we did make a video of February the 16th, which is extremely uh, informative. It goes through the incident. Um, my team uh, use their own words to describe what happened on the day, and it also tells you how we recovered from it. Uh, and if you, uh, uh, I've got my name up on the Step Change website. You contact me, we'll see if we can get you a video if you're interested in watching the video. If you really want to uh, get really bored, you can ask one of us to come up and present the video for you uh, and I'll, I'll do 